1987 is at last coming to an end. Obviously, it's been the biggest year ever for the Famicom, with around 195 games released. And we've got one more week worth of games left, including a huge one from, who else? Konami. So let's go ahead and get started. Ah, the sun shines on a bright new episode of Crontendo. Here we are December 22nd for the last few games of 1987. Our first title is Gegege no Kitaro 2 from Bandai. Let me start out by saying this is a pretty cool opening sequence. I don't know who developed this game, but so far so good. So Gegege no Kitaro is of course the long-running manga and anime series about a yokai, which is a particular kind of Japanese ghost. The series is quite popular in Japan. You might remember, we saw the very first Kotaro game from Crontendo Episode 8. That was one of the earliest post-Mario side-scrollers for the Famicom. This was a pretty basic game, sort of run around and choose different levels and uh, shoot stuff, but naturally things have changed in the last year and a half, and the simple platformer games are no longer in vogue. So it turns out the second Kotaro game is in fact a Zelda-esque RPG. Seriously, what else would you expect? Now we have an unofficial English translation patch, which is quite good, and one of the people involved also translated Middleton Saga. It's great the folks are working to make these games accessible to more people. Now I call this an RPG, but basically it's probably influenced as much by Zelda as by Dragon Quest. The battles are turn-based, and they're surprisingly fully animated. Katara will run forward and attack enemies, and when he successfully avoids enemies' attack, you'll see him dart to the side. However, the RPG elements have been simplified quite a bit. You do get experience points, you level up and learn magic, you will have attack and defense stats, but there's no money or shops involved. There are items, but no equipable weapons or armor, exactly. Healing items are dropped by enemies, so you have to worry about inventory or anything like that. One of the first things you find is Kotaro's house there. You can rest and replenish your health for free. There aren't any real villages or anything, and not much in terms of NPCs. Okay, so I've just leveled up and obtained the Hair Needle spell, which is simply a more powerful attack that uses magic points. I'll go ahead and uh, use it against this guy. Now, one annoying thing, Kataro seems somewhat padded because you actually level up very slowly. Most enemies will grant you a measly one experience point. Even tougher enemies you face later don't really give much more experience. Now here I'm about to find the, uh, the first castle, where the first boss is found. Enemies are tackled, by the way, one at a time, meaning if you encounter a group, you will battle each one separately, one after the other. Oh yes, and I hate this, you often will fight enemies and have them escape right before you defeat them, robbing you of some experience. These guys are sort of tough, yet you still only get one experience point for each one you defeat. Don't they know that's against RPG rules? Tougher enemies are supposed to give more experience. Combat, even against the bosses, is quite simple. You really just sort of need to hit them with your strongest attack over and over. Ah, there's the first boss right there. If necessary, you can use a healing item. Either you've leveled up enough to defeat the boss, or you're not. There's really not much strategy. This guy will yield a gigantic uh, 10 experience points, as well as an item that supposedly increases your attack. Just like in Dragon Quest 1, you have to use torches to see your way around in dungeons. This isn't really quite a dungeon as much as a tunnel to move from one area to the next. One weird thing, when you're on the overworld, you'll encounter these weird force fields that prevent you from passing the certain areas. The game calls them yokai storms. When you first encounter a yokai storm, it looks like a glitch, as the screen like flashes in a very irritating fashion. The video can't actually capture it. Quickly, flashing effects tend to get lost in videos. But when you saw me walk around like on the black screen there a second ago, that's the pattern you would see flashing on and off very quickly while playing the game in this area. So I just got the second party member. Though they don't really function like regular party members, more like magic spells. You can use them during battle and they have special abilities. Now it turns out that storm is caused by a floating rock. Defeating it will then sort of allow you to access new areas you couldn't get to earlier because of the storm. Eventually throughout the game you will travel around Japan, even to Korea. Taro Toe is not really a bad game, and it's pleasantly competent for a Zelda Dragon Quest mashup produced by Bandai. There are some things I don't like, such as the slow experience gathering, the fact that it's difficult to find a way around the overworld, but I was expecting much worse.
Jesus, it's Sequel Mania here on Crontendo. From Namco, we have Pro Yaku Family Stadium 87, which is obviously a sequel to Pro Yaku Family Stadium from December 1986. That game was released in the U.S. by Tengen as RBA Baseball in 1988, one of the few licensed titles from Tengen. So, much like the first Family Stadium game, you select from several vaguely described Japanese teams, though everything here is supposedly based on real teams and players, and each player has their own distinct stats. You can play against the computer, against another person, or enter the watch mode. Those of you who have played RBI Baseball or remember Crontendo episode 13, where we played the first game, will say, hmm, this looks exactly like that game. That's because Family Stadium 87 is a slightly updated version of that first game. The graphics, gameplay, all that is virtually exactly the same. A very few minor changes have been made. There are new teams, for example. But this is really a revision of the first game rather than a brand new title. Uh, thankfully, these weren't quite full price games. The sticker price was 3,900 yen, as opposed to 5,300 or 5,500 most games cost back then. But either way, Madden NFL definitely would not invent the practice of releasing similar games each year. So, in case you're wondering, was this game released in the US? Well, no, not really. Tengen did release an RBI Baseball 2 in 1990, I think. But this seems to have been developed internally. It was definitely not the same game as Pro Yaku 87, though uh, some graphics were carried over from the first RBI Baseball, like the baseball diamond background. So you can definitely see some similarities. But Family Stadium and RBI Baseball became two different series after the first game. Now this game was very successful in Japan. Uh, both of the first two games made that Famitsu Top 100 list from last episode. One interesting thing, kind of a little bug I suppose, I noticed it was possible to sort of spam the computer's batters by throwing lots of knuckleballs. They frequently strike out on knuckleballs for some reason. Well, there you have it. Good going, Namco. I guess we'll see the same game again in 1988. Here we go, the last big game of 1987, the one that kicked off a series still going strong today, the original Metal Gear, released by Konami in Japan, as seen on the title screen. In the US, Metal Gear was released in 1988 by Ultra, with this slightly different title screen, and in Europe it was released by Palcom, but more about that later. But this is not really the original Metal Gear. No, the familiar NES version was a port. The original Metal Gear was released for the MX2 computers in July of 1987. A number of changes were made, so we're going to take an unusual step here by examining both versions together. This is the MSX version. It sports better graphics for one, and also a completely different beginning. Solid Snake infiltrates Outer Heaven via water, armed with only a pack of cigarettes. How did they keep dry, I wonder? Now, Metal Gear has a lot of dialogue, in the form of radio transmissions between Snake and Big Boss, and other operatives. Big Boss gives you mission briefings, tips, and so on. Right away, he advises you not to let the guards see ya. Metal Gear is what you call a stealth game. You can attack guards, but if you cross their line of sight, the alert is sounded and more guards rush in, and you may get killed very quickly. Metal Gear was created by a young game designer named Hideo Kojima. He was responsible for the MSX version, but the Famicom port was handled by a completely different team at Konami, who altered Kojima's game in several ways. The Famicom game, seen here, begins with Snake and three other guys parachuting into the jungle. Snake will then need to cross several screens before reaching Outer Heaven. The English text in the NES version is notoriously bad. I feel asleep being sort of one of the classic examples of bad game translation. This new introductory sequence is not really as well constructed as the rest of the game. For example, you have to bypass some dogs who always wake up when you go by. And at certain moments, it's uh, virtually impossible to avoid getting shot by the guards. You'll need to scrounge around for rations and key cards here. You also have to do a bit of traveling around in these trucks. Here's one annoyance. When he exits this truck, there's a guard standing right outside, and he's pretty much impossible to avoid as he rushes right towards you. So, while not exactly bad, this rather inartfully designed beginning sets the Famicom Metal Gear off on kind of a bad foot. Once you enter in the front door of Outer Heaven, the two versions become almost identical for a while. You know, funny, we see all these tanks and vehicles inside Outer Heaven, but never a door big enough to actually get a tank to pass through. As mentioned, Metal Gear has you avoiding enemies. 
this might be the first widely popular stealth game, but other games existed before this one. Perhaps the very first being Castle Wolfenstein, the original Castle Wolfenstein, an Apple II game from 1981 in which you need to escape from a castle while avoiding detection from it by Nazis. Though Kojima changed the setting to one a bit more influenced by American action movies such as Escape from New York and The Terminator. Here, seen side by side for the millionth time, is the cover art from Metal Gear and this photo of Kyle Reese from The Terminator. Obviously, Snake's appearance has changed a bit since then. Going back to the MSX game, here's another area that's different. The clearing inside the base where you find some trucks and the first keycard. The keycards are a vital part of this game. Virtually every door is locked and requires a certain keycard to open. This gives Metal Gear a certain Metroid feel. You find locked doors that can't be opened until you come back later with the right card. Also crucial, rescuing the POWs held inside Outer Heaven. Aside from giving out plot details, the POWs will increase your rank, which will in turn increase your life bar and the amount of rations and ammo you can carry. I believe that you actually need to be at rank 4 in order to finish the game. Now there are a lot of items to carry in Metal Gear, most of which are mandatory for certain areas. The gas mask, for example, is required to cross gas-filled rooms. You also need a compass, bombs, an oxygen tank, and various other inventory items. Metal Gear is notable for the sheer amount of weapons and gear you have to acquire. Big Boss, rather, conveniently forgets to tell you several rather important things in this game. Another very cool item is guidable missiles, needed, for example, to take out the control panels on electric floors. These things are very useful, actually. I believe that Big Boss forgets to tell you about the electric floors as well. And also in this game we have the debut of that Metal Gear favorite, the Cardboard Box. Good thing everyone at Outer Heaven is really stupid, but the box is actually good when you're trying to avoid getting seen by a video camera as well. Lines of sight are very important in this game. You can often stand right next to an enemy without being detected, as long as you are not directly in front of them. And there is another video game cliché that makes for an early appearance here. At a certain point you will automatically get captured and all your equipment is taken away. You know, despite being one of the world's greatest super spies, Snake tends to get captured a lot. As it turns out you would reach sort of a dead end at this point, and getting captured rather conveniently takes you to another part of the base which you wouldn't otherwise be able to reach. Since Metal Gear is from 1987, naturally you'll escape from your prison cell by finding the hidden door. Once you've escaped, you'll come across the first boss, a guy called Shoot Gunner. This looks hopeless, but it turns out all your weapons and supplies are stashed in a nearby unlocked room. If I were a video game bad guy and I captured the hero, I'd immediately have all his stuff tossed into the incinerator. The bosses in Metal Gear are a little odd. They often seem difficult at first glance, but actually are very simple to defeat. With uh, Shoot Gunner, for example, you can just hide behind the crates and fire missiles at them. The bosses tend to be a little disappointing, as they require virtually no skill to defeat. One difference in the uh, layout of the MSX and the NSS version is this screen right here. You actually have to sort of run through this little maze to avoid dogs and blow holes in walls. In the NES version, it's just regular standard rooms. Now eventually you'll make your way to the roof and cross this treacherous bridge. At this point in the NES game, you'll find Twin Shot, two brothers with machine guns. Again, they're very simple. You can take them out just by standing in the right spot and tossing grenades at them. One thing about the, the NES version it's a lot easier than the MSX game. The guards in the NES game are much slower and uh, less aggressive. Getting spotted in the MSX version will usually result in you taking a whole lot of bullets. These jetpack guys, for example, they are all over you in the MSX game, but pretty much harmless in the Famicom game. And instead of Twin Shot, the original boss here was a Hind D helicopter, maybe inspired by the movie Rambo. As always, this guy turns out to be a cakewalk. After defeating him, you need to use a parachute to jump off the roof and land in the yard to get Key 4. There's really nothing like this part in the NES version. Key Card 4 is found in a truck outside the compound. You can actually obtain it at the very beginning of the game. And of course, we cannot discuss the two Metal Gears without mentioning one tiny little fact. The console port is inferior in almost every single way to the original. The MSX game obviously features much better graphics. The NES also suffers um, from some rather ugly colors. The better visuals and music gives the N MSX release uh, a lot more atmosphere. You also don't have to go through menus to bring up weapons and items, it can be done with just one keystroke. And there is a major change in the NES game, which we'll see a bit later. In either version, Metal Gear features more of a plot than most other video games at this time. 
the game does start messing with you, like Big Boss advises uh, you to do some rather stupid things, like getting into the truck he, like, that he tells you to will actually take you back to the beginning of the game. And later on he even commands you to abort the mission. The MSX version goes even so far as to kind of break the fourth wall at one point, when Big Boss tells you to turn off your MSX. So Kojima was really sort of pulling weird stuff like this, even in his very first game. So going back to the plot, once you've found Gray Fox, he'll point you in the direction of a scientist who actually invented Metal Gear. You will then need to move on to another building behind the main compound, and find the scientist's kidnapped daughter, and uh, cross a scorpion-filled desert, and fight two androids called Arnold's, as well as a boomerang-wielding nutso called Coward Duck, who has the final key card. While Metal Gear falls into a particular category of Konami games, that would be sort of the top-down, flip-screen action-adventure game. Uh, for example, see also King Kong 2, Love Warrior Nicole, and so on. It does change the formula a bit with its heavy dialogue, its emphasis on stealth, plot twists, and Metroid-like level design. The whole game is actually just one large level. That's perhaps the most hated part of the game right there, those awful booby traps in the floor. Eventually you'll find another foxhound agent and discover that, yes, Big Boss is a traitor, and he's the one actually behind Outer Heaven and Metal Gear. And finally you face Metal Gear itself. You need to blow it up by uh, attaching 16 explosives to its feet in a particular order. And then, just like Metroid, you've got to make a mad dash to the exit before the whole base blows up. Now here comes the most baffling change, in the console version. In the Famicom game, you blow up not Metal Gear, but actually a giant computer. Yes, Metal Gear is missing from the game Metal Gear. Why? What was the reasoning behind that decision? Who knows? And then, surprise, you must defeat Big Boss before you can escape. Once again, the difficulty has been doned down quite a bit for the Famicom. Actually, everything has sort of been dumbed down in the Famicom game. Even the ending is a little lame. You need to choose between three exits. In the MSX game, there are three ladders, two of which lead to a dead end. In the Famicom version, well, you know, it's odd there's these three elevators, but the wrong two simply keep ascending up and up indefinitely until the timer runs out and you die. This makes really no sense at all. I mean, how can one elevator have a shorter path to the surface? Now, while the MSX game is better, it's certainly not perfect by any means. For example, having to constantly try out every single key card whenever you want to open a door gets real tiring real quickly. And it's easy to get lost in Outer Heaven. A map would have been nice. And the console version is still very well designed, it's inventive and still a fun game, it's just not as good as the original. And the final cutscene in the MSX version is super cool. Seems like every Konami game ends like this, the base blows up. In this case, Outer Heaven actually blows up twice. After Metal Gear, Kojima mostly stuck with designing games for the MSX. His next project would be a very interesting little adventure game called Snatcher. And uh, finally in 1990, a uh, sequel for Metal Gear for the MSX called Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake would come out. And this game is really a major step forward over Metal Gear. Metal Gear 2 is really a pretty fantastic looking game. It plays a lot like a 2D version of Metal Gear Solid, and it has some great features like an in-game map. And you can actually play both MSX games and release of Metal Gear Solid 3, uh, known as Metal Gear Solid 3 Substance, for the PlayStation 2. In the US, Konami released Metal Gear as the first game on its Ultra label. Nintendo's licensing agreement for the NES in the United States allowed a publisher only five games a year. But a special exception was made for Konami, which allowed them to release another five games under the Ultra name. Sadly, Metal Gear 2 was never ported to the console, and a rather inferior sequel called Snake's Revenge was uh, created for the US market with no input from Kojima. So 1987 has been a fantastic year for Konami, and Metal Gear is the cherry on top. And well, we'll actually see their first game of 1988 later this episode. Something we don't see too much of nowadays is a straightforward arcade port. So here's Magnum Kiki Apatsu, Empire City 1931, from Toshiba EMI. Magnum Kiki Apatsu might mean something like Magnum in the nick of time. In case you're wondering, that secret, that's your password, only four letters. Empire City looks and plays like a light gun game, but it isn't. Essentially it's a light gun game that uses the D-pad instead. 
The arcade game was released in 1986 and goes by the name simply of uh, Empire City 1931. It was created by Seibu Kaihatsu, who are mostly known for their series of Raiden shoot 'em ups. It was distributed by Taito and Romstar in the US. The Famicom version never had a US release, but like so many other Japanese titles, it was considered. An ad for Rambo in the July issue of Nintendo Fun Club News announces it as coming soon, along with Airwolf and something called WWF Superstars, which presumably was the game released as WWF WrestleMania. It also is mentioned in the Game Pack Roundup in the next issue of Nintendo Power. Alright, so about the game itself, well, it's a decent entry in the shoot gangster genre. We've already seen several games like this. Hogan's Alley had a very similar sequence. Gangster Town for the Sega Master System was another very similar idea, though that game was much more frantically paced. Here, gangsters will appear in doorways and windows, and on occasion, one will appear off screen and start shooting at you while running. You will need to hurry up and find him and shoot him before he takes you out. Everything is reasonably well illustrated. The gangsters are stylishly drawn and assume dramatic poses when shot. There are a limited number of levels, and they repeat. You have to play the same levels over and over again to finish the game. Well, there's a weird thing. Superman suddenly appears. Rather bizarre coincidence, because you also have the Superman game this episode. So, all in all, not a bad game. Might have made more sense as a light gun game, but the D-pad works reasonably well. And after that, let's switch gears a bit to this piece of junk, Animal Attack Gakuen, or Animal Attack Academy. Look familiar? Yes, this is a Space Harrier clone, or maybe a 3D World Runner clone, or some combination most likely. The games from Pony Canyon was apparently developed by Citron and Art, uh, Citron being a record label that specialized in video game soundtracks. I guess they got into development uh, for a little while. I'll admit the music is catchy, but the game... Well, it's a lame space hero clone with a wacky theme. You see, you're a schoolgirl in a sailor outfit. Who can fly? And you are battling animals which have turned against humanity, I think. For some reason, they're very hard to hit in this game, and they'll collide with you sooner than you think, once they've reached about three quarters of the screen depth towards you, so be careful. And the first boss was apparently a machine gun toting koala? You might think this sounds sort of cool, but really it's not. Uh, this game would be an example of the typical Japanese wacky game design. While some excellent games have been made in this style, think of Proteus, it does more often seem to be used to try to disguise a lack of good gameplay. Low budget titles like this will, you know, sort of lack anything to distinguish the game in terms of quality, so they'll throw in some cactuses with hats to distract gamers. So if you are looking for a dull, goofy Space Harrier clone, uh, Animal Attack Gakuen is your game. Here is a little-loved license title from Kimco, Superman, based on, well, Superman. Note the music playing here and the credit to First Star. Superman looks very young and very pissed off in this game, as he should be. Kimco naturally Superman in the US, but with different music. Does this sound sort of familiar? Well, it should be. We heard it just a few episodes ago in the Kimco RPG Indoor no Hikari. The Japanese version used a version of the uh, John Williams theme from the Superman movie. I assume Kimco didn't want or couldn't get the rights to the music for the US release. Some graphical changes were made as well. The Superman sprite has a smaller head and a less furious facial expression. Oh yeah, and what about the American Way? And dear god, that is one freaky looking Statue of Liberty. The statue actually speaks to Superman? Uh, yeah, this game is nothing less than good old-fashioned Kasoge, delivered to Western gamers for a change. Superman, I guess, falls into the category of a side-scrolling action-adventure game with very light RPG elements, though that description makes it sound better than it really is. Granted, Kimco's original titles aren't really known for their high quality, but their production values here are surprisingly bad. The other characters and various NPCs are really ugly-looking, even for a 1987 game. And why does the background go black whenever any text appears? 
there had to be a better solution to putting text into the game. Now one nice thing about the game is there is actually a handy map screen. Superman's game world consists of several long horizontal levels connected by an underground passage or subway line. Now Superman is supposedly a crime fighter, yet his hometown Metropolis is depicted as being probably the most violent uh, crime-filled city in human history, with the exception of the cities in Toachiki's Sherlock Holmes game. You literally cannot step out of the Daily Planet building and onto the street without gangsters shooting at you. Hell, they start shooting at you even when you're still dressed as Clark Kent. You would think the local presence of Superman would deter crime just a little bit, but no, it seems that gangsters have completely taken over the city. There is a logical reason for this, however. In this game, Superman is really not that super. He can be killed by bullets, can't fly very well, and it takes him about three punches to knock out a normal human. The player's goal here is to follow the leads given to you by the NPCs, which usually involves entering a certain building. The majority of gameplay involves walking, yes, walking, from one location to the other. Constantly walking back and forth over the same streets makes this a pretty monotonous game. Those little things that pop out of enemies will refill your superpower, that is, your health. Except the red or green ones, those are kryptonite. The other icons, like the one I caught a second ago, were right there. Those are actually uh, your superpowers, which are confusingly called item power in the game. These operate just like magic spells in most RPGs. Superman has very limited flying abilities, but if your flight meter is full enough, you can fly to nearby locations. This is done by accessing the map. And you can't just fly anywhere, so most of the time Superman travels on foot. Now, here is Zeor, the first boss. I was using my heat vision a bit against her. Superman doesn't exactly contain great boss battles. Now, I know that video game localization was a relatively new concept at the time, but uh, this game does have a lot of weird issues. Like, seriously, daily planets? And Superman defeats the Zod gang? They are the final bosses in the game, not the boss I just defeated. Did Temco USA not have a QA department? Unlike, say, Batman, Superman has not had a very successful career in video games. Now this one right here is not the first Superman game. That honor belongs to Atari Superman from 1978. The Atari game, while well, quite dated looking today, was in fact extremely innovative on a number of levels, aside from being the first game based on a licensed property. There was also a computer game published by First Star, the same guys who did Spy vs. Spy. Kimiko apparently had to get the rights for a Superman game from them, despite this not being a port of that game. Now this game is really not very faithful to the original conception of Superman. I mean, like, random NPCs will actually insult you and threaten you on the streets. That would be completely insane. And to get around town more quickly, you take the subway? Really, no wonder no one's scared of this guy. I mean, look how short he was in that subway scene. Why didn't they make the other figures the same uh, scale as Superman? Now in part two, Superman is investigating a stock market crash engineered by a Chinese gang. Here he's using his super breath to put out fires. I just got a sort of a power up there. And you really must have balls of steel to insult Superman's costume to his face like this. Now while the controls in combat are very simple, the game has some weird ideas about hit detection, as I'm sure you've noticed. You can punch an enemy from some distance. In fact, you actually have to do that if you don't want to uh, take any damage. Now, Superman is definitely not the worst game on the system, but it is quite bad. And its sort of reckless handling of the Superman mythos is pretty amusing. I suppose it's not nearly the disaster of uh, Superman 64. Oh, I'm sure it's difficult to make a game about a guy who's invincible, but Kimco's solution, turning Superman into sort of a wuss, is probably not the best idea. So here we are, the last Japanese game of 1987, and it's another family trainer game from Bandai. It's a weird one because it's the first family trainer game to be based on an existing property. Namely, the Takeshi's Castle TV show, which ran from 1986 to 1989 in Japan. This was one of those crazy and dangerous looking uh, game shows that Japan was infamous for back then. Contestants had to do a number of difficult physical challenges that usually ended with them falling to a water tank. The idea was to storm the castle, which belonged to none other than Takeshi Kitano himself. So there are now two Takeshi Kitano games, the first one being Taito's infamous Takeshi no Tozenjo. Now many of you in the US will recognize this as being the show that the most extreme elimination challenge was based on. 
There are several short challenges based on events from the original show. Most are based on running and jumping on the mat, and you're scored on how quickly you complete them. Some of these are actually a bit difficult to figure out. Like this one, for example, I couldn't keep from falling off the bridge. Something very interesting about the game, it was developed by Human, who did all those other Family Trainer games, and if you ever wondered as to how long the development cycle was for Famicom games back then, well, it was actually sometimes very short. An interview with Hitoshi Akashi, formerly of Human, or rather Sonata, as it was actually called back in 1987, was published on the Game Developers Research Institute not that long ago, in which Akashi states that the game was developed in one month. We now think of games as taking at least a year or two to make, so the fact this was programmed in one month is pretty amazing. This is the 8th Family Trainer game, and if you're getting sick of them, well, rejoice, there's only a few more, and it's actually going to be quite a while before we see the next one, so the series is very clearly winding down. Before we close out in 1987, we have one last straggler, a US release from Acclaim that came out sometime in December. Oh how cute, it's got a high score screen. And look at that, the game was developed by Rare. This is the second NES game by Rare, and incidentally, the first original NES title from Acclaim. In fact, Wizards and Warriors might be the first completely Western-originated NES game. I don't know if LJN's Gacha game was developed by a Japanese company, but Jaws and Karate Kid were, so it's likely Gacha was too. So, Wizards and Warriors has some big shoes to fill. How does it do? Well, opinions on this game are mixed. Boy, someone chopped down a lot of trees. I think they may have chopped them down closer to the ground as well. Of course, that's just one of the many things that make no sense. Like that eagle that uh, just sort of sits on a tree stump shooting fireballs. I mean, come on, it's a bird, it should be flying, right? Well, anyway, here's the story. You're a knight out to rescue some kidnapped princesses, but you can't just go directly to Villain's castle. No, you need to tunnel underneath the ground and come out on the other side of the castle. But at various points you're blocked by another knight who demands 100 jewels to let you pass. So your knight needs to jump around and collect 100 jewels in every level. The first level, the forest level, has you jumping on treetops and looking inside hollow tree trunks. Now aside from jewels you want to grab any keys you find. This will allow you to open up any chests of the same color. Um, except that you don't actually use the keys to unlock chests, no. If you find a blue key, and you come across the blue chest, the chest will already be unlocked and opened. It's almost kind of like finding the blue key automatically opens all the chests by remote control. Now one thing, this game did actually come out in Japan with a slightly different title screen under the name Densetsu no Kishi Elrond, but some changes were made. Namely, where's all the enemies? Yeah, they removed the enemies except the ones that are inside the tree trunks. And sort of the display was changed as well a bit. Maybe they figured Japanese gamers would be somewhat irritated by the enemy placement, which tends to have a lot of little flying enemies coming at you at completely unexpected random angles. The sword you start out with is pretty much worthless, so it's a good idea to sort of pick up some better weapons by looking in the chests. Alright, so once you've got enough jewels, go to the Red Knight and he'll let you pass. But you know what? He didn't actually take any of the jewels. I still have like 145 jewels after I went past the Red Knight. Why did he demand 100 jewels and then let me pass without taking any? Well, at any rate, at this point we drop down to the trunk and meet the uh, first boss. Oh yeah, and getting that uh, dagger of throwing will be quite helpful for this boss. A few things about Wizards and Warriors. Well, it's an ugly game, that's for sure. The color scheme is certainly uh, worse than most NES games of this era. Rare seems to have a real fondness for baby blue, red, light purple, and Pepto-Bismol pink. So many enemies, like even the eagles and spiders, are pink. Uh, Rare doesn't seem to realize you could actually make things more than one color. All those years of working on spectrums must be responsible. Oh well, yeah, I love the fact that, like, we, as we saw a second ago, when you find a princess, they're all tied up and in their underwear. Now from here on you move out to an underground cave level, and after this there's another cave level, and then two more cave levels, and then a forest level. Then you move on to the castle. Alright, so this is sort of a terrible game, but one other thing, what's with the name? Box art depicts like an actual warrior dude, and the bad guy is a wizard, but Wizards and Warriors is an inappropriate name for a game that's about a knight. And that's sort of a rare tradition, I guess. Saber Wolf didn't really seem to be about a wolf or a saber. Knight lore, on the other hand, is about a werewolf, but is short on knights. This game has a knight, but not too many wizards or warriors. Rare has some rather odd naming conventions. Probably the best thing about this game is the music from David Wise. 
Uh, this must have sold well as there were two sequels, but uh, one gets the feeling Rare hasn't quite gotten the hang of making NES games. We are finally at January 1988. Obviously the release schedule slows down this early in the year, but we've still got some interesting stuff going on. If anything, 1988 is even bigger than 1987. We'll see the biggest selling standalone title ever for the system, as well as the game that ranks as the number two bestseller for the Famicom in Japan. In the United States, 1988 was the year that the NES went from being a very successful video game console to a cultural phenomenon, with yearly sales reaching the billion dollar mark. And it all begins rather humbly. Didn't we just see Family Stadium 87? And now it's another entry in Namco's Family Sports series, but this time it's Family Circuit, a racing game. Though I did like Namco's spiffy little intro there a second ago. They kick off 1988 with a splash. Note Game Studio's name in the credits. As is expected, various menu options let you choose the type of race, type of car, even the car's color scheme. You can also adjust various functional elements of the car. Acceleration, handling, and so on. It's interesting to observe that a lot of menus and options are slowly becoming standard for such things as racing games, as in Taito's Grand Prix from last episode. But unlike Taito Grand Prix, this is a top-down racing game, sort of like Nintendo's Famicom Grand Prix F1 race from October 1987. Now this game must hold the record for at least convincing depiction of crowd spectators. That's really not how you're supposed to do it there. Now, Family Stadium uh, has sort of a pole position like qualifying time trial. If you do well, you get a better starting position. And the handling does take some getting used to, as I discovered there just a moment ago. This is the simplest track, and they're all named after real locations. I believe the final track is Daytona, though I'm not sure if the tracks are actually based on the real racetracks. You don't normally see that sort of like a lifelike detail in a racing game from 1988. The developer game studio is of course Masanobu Indus Company. Last episode we saw their version of Wizardry, so they must have been pretty busy around this time. Now this is certainly not a bad game by any means. I'm not terribly fond of top-down racing games, but the sheer amount of customization available gives us a bit of an edge over similar games. Oddly, there have been a lot of racing games for the Famicom, but they are almost never released in the US. I'm not really sure why. Next month, Nintendo will release a top-down racing game in the US only, so I suppose that Japan and the US were considered to have different tastes in racing games or something like that. I'd say that in terms of sort of general gameplay, I actually prefer this over the Nintendo top-down racing game. And if you actually win, of course, you get to stand around uh, throwing bottles of champagne everywhere. There have been a lot of racing games lately. We're actually going to see one next episode and then the episode after that as well. Well, we've just started 1988, and already we've got another murder mystery adventure game. This is Satsui no Kaiso, Powersoft Satsujin Jiken, published by HAL, and apparently developed by a little-known company called Hyperware. What does the title mean exactly? Well, I'm not quite sure, though Google mysteriously translates it as Hierarchy of the Night, though I'm really not quite sure about that. This game seems a lot like any other adventure game. You have your menu-based commands that you access with the D-pad. Is this genre already becoming a little bit stagnant? So far, Nintendo seems to be the only one really trying to shake it up a bit with games like the Nakayama Miho one, or Shin Onigashima. Otherwise, they all seem to start with a dead body being found, then you look for clues, ask questions. It seems like there was much more variety and innovation in the US computer adventure game genre around the same time. As it turns out, we do have a very different type of console adventure game later this episode, so I shouldn't really complain too much. I just don't think these murder mystery games will abate anytime soon. Even Nintendo will jump on that particular bandwagon a little bit later in the year. Konami begins 1988 with something we've never quite seen before, a crazy little mashup of different Konami games called YY World. 
I suppose this is sort of an early form of fan service. Various Konami characters come together for a non-canonical adventure. That's Dr. Cinnamon from Twinbee. This game also features Konami Man. And Dr. Cinnamon just happens to have a female android who wears a bikini. Now really, Dr. Cinnamon, come on. We all know what you had in mind when you built Konami Lady. So Konami Man and Konami Lady uh, will go out and find various missing heroes. Bay door number one will take you to Dr. Cinnamon, who will heal you in between levels. Bay door number three can't be opened yet. And door number two is where you choose your first level. Each of the six levels are based on a Konami game. Yep, Huawei World has a very similar layout to Mega Man. Or so it seems. You actually can't do the levels in just any order. Certain characters are required to get through all the way through certain levels. We'll start with a Castlevania level. Interestingly, the game that this sort of most resembles is Castlevania. The levels are laid out much like Castlevania levels, horizontal scrolling with lots of staircases. The goal of each level is to rescue a kidnapped character, Simon Belmont in this case. The other characters are Mikey from Goonies, Gunbar Goemon, King Kong, Fuma from Getsufu Maden, and a Moai head. No solid snake, I'm afraid. You'll occasionally come across that thing like the flashing box we saw a moment ago. You can't obtain those sorts of things yet. Only Goemon can open those particular boxes. You often have to return to later levels to get special weapons and whatnot. Levels generally have a boss of some sort. That guy is pretty easy. Once you obtain the key, you can rescue the level's hero. Simon uncharacteristically jumps up and down when you free him. One thing about YY World, it makes no attempt to integrate the story into the narratives of the various characters or really make any sense whatsoever. Nor is there any sort of characterization involved. No one other than Dr. Cinnamon actually says anything. YY World is really just a standard action game, but instead of changing weapons, your entire sprite changes. Dracula, for example, is seen there is not a boss, he's simply a difficult enemy who appears here. If you defeat him, he'll reappear, but Dracula has nothing to do with the game's plot. One thing YY World does have is gambling. Some levels have buildings you can duck into for a quick dice roll or pull of the slot machine handle. Gambling minigames seem to be becoming sort of common in Japanese titles. For example, Dragon Quest, Doki Doki Panic, and Bio Senshi Dan. This next level is Japanese themed, and you are rescuing Ganbar Goemin. Each character has a different special weapon. As you can see, I found Simon's cross up, up there at the top underneath his character portrait. Now, Goemin has a very short range attack, but is very fast. Enemies freeze for a sec when you hit them, and Goemin's attack is fast enough that you can keep hitting them very, very quickly before they unfreeze, so he's actually very useful. And by the way, the heart refills that you see actually refill your health in this game, unlike in Castlevania. Rockets are what refill your special weapons. As I said earlier, the sense of freedom you get when being asked to choose your level is a little deceptive. You can't just start on any level. Certain characters are required to pass certain parts in each level. Here is Hell, by the way, the uh, level where you find Fuma. The pirate ship is where you find Mikey, and he's small enough to fit in areas other characters can't reach. And incidentally, the cityscape is King Kong's level, and Easter Island is where you find the Moai head. There's also a vertical shoot-em-up sequence where you play as Twinbee or Vic Viper. So the thing about YY World, it sounds more fun than it actually is. The gameplay is pretty average. It's a bit of a shame, since it takes characters from a number of interesting unique games and puts them into what's really just a typical platform-type game. Now, there are some things I actually sort of, you know, do not like. For example, the final level, which is sort of like a science fiction theme level. There's all these bot blob things that attach themselves to you and you can't get them off, and they just slowly drain health. And every single jump, it seems, is spaced so that if you're not right on the very edge of the platform, you won't quite make the next platform. The graphics are okay, nothing too special. One cool thing is the way that um, when you change your characters, the music changes. Here's the final boss, by the way. He's a little boring. And then we get the Metroid-style timer before the base blows up. Uh, just like in Metal Gear, I guess. I was a bit disappointed, but I'm glad Konami is filling its oats, so to speak. It must have felt confident in gamers' awareness of the Konami brand to even release a game like this. Oh, by the way, this is a translated version that sort of mangled the uh, closing credits there. Later in 1988, Konami would release a game called Parodius, which had a very similar idea, but ultimately ended up being a much more successful series. Before we get into January officially, let's cover one last thing. There seems to be some confusion over the release date of this game, SD Gundam World, Gachapon Senshi Scramble Wars. 
The list of FDS games on the Japanese Wikipedia says January 20th, 1988, but another page says November 20th, 1987, and some US sources say November 22nd. One explanation seems to be that November was the boxed retail release and January was the Famicom Disk Reader System release. Anyway, this is the second Gundam game we've seen, the first SD Gundam game. Probably a lot of you already know this, but Bandai released a whole series of toys, cartoons, comics, and games based on SD Gundam. Cute, super deformed versions of the Gundam mechs. Crazy. The first Gundam game was sort of an action-based affair, but SD Gundam is a turn-based strategy game. What? Seriously? The first thing you do is choose one of many scenarios found on the main menu. When the game starts, you'll be taken to the map screen and begin playing. Now this is the first strategy type game on the Famicom, but the genre has been around for quite a while. War games were some of the very first computer games released. For example, Empire uh, has existed in many forms, and this is one of the uh, sort of prototypical explore, build armies, conquer cities, and fight type games. These sorts of games would later be known as 4X games. Another such example, this time from 1984, is Incunabula. Generally speaking, these games have you moving units around on a map, allocating resources to build more units, and then engaging in turn-based combat with other armies. Games like this really started blossoming in the mid to late 80s, and then kind of took over from there. Another such title was EA's Lords of Conquest. Now this type of game would eventually find its way uh, to Japan, or become quite popular for a while. The game that really kicked off this trend in Japan was from Koei and it was called Romance of the Three Kingdoms, released on the MSX in 1986. And this was the first of a long, long-running series of strategy games based around Chinese history. The object here is to manage your empire and defeat the opposing warlords in order to unite China. We'll see a, uh, of course, console port of this in the near future. Now, compared to such games, SD Gundam is pretty simple. Use your D-pad to select your Gundam dude, then you move him. It'll tell you how many spaces you have to move this particular guy. Your first order of business is to try to sort of take over the nearby cities and space stations. This will start some cash rolling in. You can move up to three guys per turn, and then it's the CPU's turn. One issue with SD Gundam, the CPU takes a damn long time to move. Alright, so the computer is thinking right now. You sort of see all the activity going on in the lower right hand side there. It'll take it a moment to calculate its move. Now once it's done thinking, it'll take the cursor to the unit it wants to move, and then move it, and then it'll start thinking again, and so on. And this seriously slows down the game. Uh, for those of you used to playing Civilization or something like that, kind of, you know, everything sort of shoots by at quick speed, you'll really be banging your head against the wall waiting for the computer to move. Now at some point, you'll come into a conflict with the enemy, and battle will ensue. But rather than sort of like in the usual, you know, random damage inflicted by most such games, you actually need to fight it out in action scenes. Yes, you see your little robots run around shooting each other until someone's health bar is depleted. You both have laser guns and a lightsaber-like uh, melee weapon. Unfortunately, these sequences are not very well executed and tend to add a bit of length to the game. Another important feature, you need to build more mechs. Because I defeated the computer's robot, I was able to take over that particular space station. Once you've got money coming in, you'll need to start building more Gundams. Rather, they're produced from these giant gotchapone machines. Gotchapones are capsule toys which come out of vending machines, quite popular in Japan. There are tons of anime and video game inspired gotchapon toys available. Now, despite some issues, SD Gundam is not really a bad game. Bandai's two main developers were Tosa and Human. They went for human for this one, which is probably a good idea. Now, while there were far better sort of military uh, turn-based strategy games released on consoles in the near future, Military Madness for the Turbo Graphics come to mind, this is really not a bad start to the wave of Famicom strategy games. Despite a decrease in the quantity and quality of FDS games, Nintendo is still continuing to support the system. And here is the next in Nintendo's long line of FDS sports games, and one that Western gamers will probably remember quite fondly, Ice Hockey. They decided to change up the selection screen a bit this time, it's not exactly the same screen as found in Volleyball. Now if you've played this game, 
you know it's stroke of genius. Rather than giving you a team of identical players, uh, like pretty much every other Famicom Sports game up until now, there are three distinct types. Lanky, Fatso, and Peewee. You can choose any combination of types you want. I've gone with two Fatsos, one Lanky, and one Peewee. The concept almost seems borrowed from Doki Doki Panic, aka Super Mario Bros. 2, the way each character has a different combination of speed and strength. Well, Fatso is the strong but slow guy, Lanky is the fast but weak guy, and Peewee is the regular guy. Fatsos are best for scoring goals since their shot's pretty fast, and they can usually knock over the other two types. Now here, by the way, is the US version, which was released pretty quickly after the Japanese disc, with some minor changes, such as the teams. Ice Hockey was co-developed by Nintendo and PAX Softnica, and it's really sort of what 8-bit sports games should be like. Fast, fun, it doesn't really try too hard to recreate the actual sport of hockey. There's really not too much to say about this game, the game sort of speaks for itself, I think, but I will make sort of a little announcement. After this, Nintendo seems to go through sort of a dry spell as a developer. The last couple years we saw Super Mario Bros., two Zelda games, Metroid, Kick Icarus, Punch-Out, and a few others. But over the next couple years, there's only going to be one major Nintendo-developed game that Western gamers are going to be familiar with. And that game is huge, but other than that, Nintendo is going to focus on the Japanese market. As for its US games, Nintendo mostly decides to turn to outside developers. So expect the number of familiar games from Nintendo to slow to a trickle after this one. As far as Kasoga-type games go, Superman was pretty bad, but it is an absolute masterpiece compared to Sukabandeka 3, from the unstoppable team of Toei and Shoei System, aka Bears. Same guys who brought you Hokuto no Ken. Does this uh, Sukabandeka sound familiar? Well, it should. It was a long-running TV show involving high school girls fighting crime, usually with a special weaponized yo-yo. Cron Sega Episode 3 featured Sukaban Deka 2, a game based on the second TV show. Not a good game, but much worse is Sukaban Deka 3, based on the third run of the TV show. I guess they had to switch out the cast members on a regular basis when they got a little too old. So, this game is about as good as the first Hokoto no Ken game, meaning that it's terrible. If you die, you get to start the whole level all over again with a different girl. There are three main characters, each with their own weapon. After a while of battling cheerleaders or whoever, the, these enemies are supposed to be, your character will get stuck for about one second, and then ninjas start coming out, or something. Really, there's no reason to play this game. Later on, there are some side-scrolling sequences and caves and whatnot, but uh, I don't think we need to pursue this any further. One thing I do like about this game is the music. Surprisingly good intro and music from Sunsoft, a company which so far has been releasing mostly crap. Well, we do see the name Tokai Engineering in the credits, who were involved in some of Sunsoft's better games. Certainly Ripple Island is much slicker than Nazalor Land. I was just lamenting the fact that so many Japanese adventure games are based on the same old murder mystery genre, and then along comes this game. Granted, the plot is not exactly fresh, a princess has been kidnapped, but hey, Ribble Island's charming little fairy book setting is a serious change of scenery. And there's a lot of cute animals in this game. It frequently seems these animals are blocking your path or something, and you need to go fetch a berry or something like that to get them to move. From what it appears, the inhabitants of Ripple Island are small people, about the same size as the animals. One thing, the name Ripple Island does make sense, but for some reason this name is often transliterated as Lipple Island, which is rather silly sounding. And I suppose that if you quickly glance at the title list of games, you might think it reads Nipple Island, which would more likely be a game for the PC-88. Well here we go, for example, this badger is standing blocking your way. Gameplay-wise, Ripple Island is really nothing new. You've sort of got your standard adventure game icons there. Move, look, talk, pick up, inventory, push and pull, so on. This game has been mocked for being sort of baffling looking and involving some scenes where you simply wander around in the grass a lot looking for something, but I'd say it's actually a pretty decent adventure game. It was popular enough to at least get a cell phone remake recently. 
Eventually you'll make your way to the castle and meet the king, who will sort of lay out some of the plot details to you. For some reason, almost all these Japanese games at some point have you talking to a king. Well, anyway, the really important thing here, I suppose, is that we finally appear to be getting something of decent quality from Sunsoft. Maybe there's hope for these guys next. In fact, a little bit later in this year, we're going to be seeing perhaps the first really sort of great Sunsoft game that we all know about, namely Master Blaster. What can we say about next episode? It's going to be huge! One of your all-time favorite Konami games is up, one of Japan's all-time favorite games as well, and a cult classic from Compile. It's all good stuff, but first we'll interrupt Crontendo for the long-awaited first episode of Cron Turbo covering the PC Engine. So keep your eyes peeled for that.